Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? Good morning. So uh, what we're doing today is that I'm just answering questions that you guys have about that final exam review that I posted under the final exam button on Canvas and seeing if there was any topics that you guys want to um, revisit and go over. So um, yeah, if you have a question, go ahead and put up an emoji, raise your hand, unmute yourself, anything like that. Go ahead and put this here for you guys. All right, so just to review what you guys are looking at over and letting me know if you have any questions. So the way the final exam review is broken down is it's broken down by unit and at the very top it has what you should focus on. So in unit one, we talked about discussing whether a study was observational or control, defining a variable as categorical or numerical, and determining if a group was a treatment or a control. Okay, that's also where we talked about lurking variables, but that's probably not gonna be on the final exam. In unit two, we talked about the mean and the median and what variation goes with each one. So for the mean, we have the standard deviation, and with the median, we have the IQR. And you should know when to use each measure. Unit three, which is probability, isn't gonna be on the final exam. That was the unit that we had the hardest time with. So um, I decided not to put that on the final exam, just to be kind of nice to you guys. For unit four, you can skip calculating percentiles. That's also not gonna be on the final exam but you will need to be able to find the average and standard deviation of data. You guys can totally use the calculators for that. You don't have to do it by hand. Okay, and you will have to use your z-score table or any of those um, calculators that I put in unit four. So those normal distribution calculators. And then for unit five, six, seven and eight, you need to know the central limit theorem and their criteria and when to use which tests and what it's telling you and how to set up those hypotheses tests, as well as a um, confidence interval. And we just went over unit nine, and there's the good stuff that you need to focus on for that unit. So having a um, cheat sheet next to you during the exam instead of having to go through all of your notes is a super good idea. So, now that we kind of did a little overview of what we studied over the entire term, um, was there anything in particular that stuck out to you guys where you'd like, oh, I'd really like to do another example of that? Or anything that you'd like to go over again? I do have some stuff, but I just need to like look at my notes real quick. Um, <clears throat> okay, that sounds good. Hi, Sherry. Morning. Thanks for letting us join you. Yeah, of course. Was there any particular topic, Sherry, that you would like to revisit or go over? Um, how tedious would it be to just um, hit the basic <clears throat> basic formulas for each of the different sections that we did? Yeah, absolutely. So while Hannah's going through her notes, I can outline for you guys what I would put on my note sheet. How does that sound? That sounds perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So if I were going to take my own final exam and I had to make a note sheet, um, here are the things that I would definitely have on my note sheet. All right. So like I said, you can skip unit three. It's not going to be on the final exam. Um, you guys have already done enough on that unit. So um, what I would put on my note sheet is I would put 
mean and standard deviation. And I would put median and IQR. And I would discuss when I should use one and what sort of rules go with one versus what sort of rules go with another one. <clears throat> so for the mean and the standard deviation, we can only use that when we have a symmetric distribution, which means that we're gonna have X bar in the middle And we're going to measure the distance our, our data is varied by how many standard deviations away it is. So remember, if data is one standard deviation away on either side, that's going to be 68% of our data. If it's two standard deviations away, that's going to be 95% of our data. And unusual data, is something that's more than two standard deviations from the mean. So that's how we decided if something was unusual. is if it fell in those two tails. And usually to determine if something was unusual, we would use that z-score. That told us how many standard deviations away an observation was from the average. Now, when it comes to calculating the standard deviation and the mean for the final exam, don't do it by hand. Just have those calculators open and use them. Okay, so don't worry about having to find the standard deviation by hand or trying to find the mean by hand. Just use those calculators and make sure you know how to use those. All right, now for the median and IQR. We're typically going to use those if we have skewed data. And remember, you can tell if it's skewed data by comparing the median to the mean. So if something's symmetric, the mean and the median are going to be relatively close to each other. However, if something is right skewed, like this is, that means that the median is going to be less than the mean. While if it's left skewed, that means that the mean is going to be less than the median. Now, the big thing that we did when we're looking at the median and the IQR, again, you don't necessarily need to know how to calculate those things because you're going to be able to use the calculator, but you should know how to read a box and whisper plot. So when you're creating a box and whisker plot, the first thing you create is this box. And that's going to be Q1, Q2, and Q3. And recall that Q2 
That's your middle 50%. That's the same thing as your median. And then each piece of this whisker box is going to represent the intervals where 25% of our data falls. Now, the last thing you're going to say about the box and whisker plot is that the length of the entire box is your IQR. That's going to tell you how much the middle 50% of your data varies. All right, one last thing for the median and IQR. So for the mean and the standard deviation, we determined if something was unusual, if it was more than two standard deviations away from the average. When we're looking at the median and IQR, if we want to look and see if something's unusual or a potential outlier, What we use is that we use those upper and lower fences. So any observation smaller than Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. And any observation larger than Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR was a potential outlier. All right, one more thing I forgot to put on here is that to calculate the IQR, you're going to take Q3 minus Q1, and that'll give you your IQR, your inner quartile range. All right. By the way, if you need me to slow down or pause at any moment so that you can finish up writing, please just let me know. You can put up a hand emoji, you can unmute and say, hang on a second. All of that is totally fine. I'm not gonna get mad. All right, so the next thing is in unit four, something that we talked about a lot was the normal distribution. Okay, that's where you have x bar, you have one standard deviation up, two standard deviations up, one below, two below. And the way that we denoted this was we said something is normal 
and we put the average here and the standard deviation here. <clears throat> Now, if we wanted to calculate a probability for this, we would have to find the z-score first. Then find z on our z-table. And that would give us the probability. And the z-score we find by hand, right? Yes. OK, cool. Good. All right, now, there were three different types of probabilities that you could have when you were doing this. One kind of probability that you could have had is, I'll actually do this on another sheet of paper. I didn't leave myself enough room. Is you could have the probability that X was less than or equal to some value. which could look something like this. And you just find P on the Z table. The other one was if x was bigger than some value, which would look like this. And when you did that, you had to do 1 minus the probability on the Z table. Hopefully this is coming back to you guys. You're like, oh yeah, I remember that. We had to minus one from all that stuff. All right, and the last one is how do you find the probability that X is between two values. Now this one is just a little bit more involved. Okay. So you're gonna find the Z score for each. and the p-value for each. And then you're going to subtract the two. All right, so there's your basic overview for unit four. <clears throat> now, when it comes to units five, six, and seven, and eight, um, I'm gonna do five, six, and seven together, and then I'll do eight separately. 
So five, six, and seven have a lot of possible overlap where it can get a little bit confusing, but we're gonna lay it all out, put in some nice tables, and hopefully it'll make it a little bit clearer for us. All right, so the big difference is that we had proportions, which is another word for percentages. And we also had averages. Which we could denote by mu or x bar. All right, so when we were dealing with proportions, we had that P was the population percentage. And P hat was our sample percentage. Now, when we wanted to know how much would our sample differentiate from our population or vice versa, we had to find something that was a lot like the standard deviation, and that was the standard error. And to calculate that standard error, we had to take P times one minus P, and then divide it by the sample size. Now, along with that, we also wanted to make sure that we met a certain set of criteria to make sure that our sample was actually good enough to run a hypothesis test on. So to make sure our sample was good enough to run a hypothesis test on, we had to meet the central limit theorem criteria for this. And the first central limit theorem criteria for any test that we're going to do is going to be randomness. And that's because it's going to reduce our bias and increase our accuracy. The second thing is that we want a large enough sample. because that's going to reduce our standard error which will increase the precision of our hypothesis test. So instead of our um, intervals being really, really big, it's going to increase the precision so that they're really small. Now the way that you do that when you're looking at proportions is that you want to make sure that you have 10 successes and at least 10 failures. And you're going to do that by multiplying your sample size times that population proportion and making sure that's greater than or equal to 10. And taking your um, sample size and multiplying it by one minus P, because that's gonna give you the number of failures, right? You're either in the success group or the failure group. All right, I'm going to hop over to averages for a second. So when we were comparing the averages of a population to a sample, we used mu and sigma to talk about the 
population where mu was the average and sigma was a standard deviation. And we used X bar and S to talk about our sample. Now, when we were talking about finding how far off we thought our sample was from our population, we also need to calculate a standard error, but it was slightly different. The standard error for this kind of example would be S divided by the square root of N. And the averages also had their own set of central limit theorem conditions that we had to meet to make sure that we had a good enough sample. It also had to be random. And it also had to be a big sample size. However, when you're talking about averages, you have a whole skew of values. You don't just have two groups, either successes or failures. So how do we determine if we have a big enough sample? This was actually a lot easier. And the way that we did that is we just wanted to make sure that n was greater than or equal to 30. All right, so after all of that stuff was checked, so we have our population, our standard error, we checked the central limit theorems, then it was time to actually run a test. So when we actually run the test, that means gather the numbers that we're going to use to compare our sample to our population and determine if they're close enough to each other or significantly far away. Here, we would use a Z test statistic. And in averages, we would use something called a t-test. So these two things are very similar. The big difference, though, is that the t-test also is going to depend on the size of our sample, which means we had to utilize degrees of freedom. And the Z test and the T test determine if the if they're the sample is reflecting the population like accurately? Yep. Okay. Yep. So this is used in hypothesis testing. Okay. All right, good. And then for both of these, the rule of thumb was that you would use these to find your p-value. And if your p-value was less than your significance level, you got to reject your h naught, And that was true for both of these. So remember that rhyme, if p is low, reject ho. There it is, that's how you do it. All right, now, just a quick note before I move on to confidence intervals and um, how to calculate those and when to use them. This is all for hypothesis testing. And the key thing for hypothesis testing is knowing how to set up your hypothesis test and checking that the central limit theorem is met. After that, you can find the test statistic and the p-value 
using the calculator. That is what I expect you to do on the exam. So you can absolutely 100% use technology. Okay, just remember how to set those um, hypothesis tests up and stuff, which I felt like you guys totally, you're all very good at that. So. All right. <clears throat> And then finally, confidence intervals. So again, we're going to have two versions of confidence intervals. One's if you're dealing with proportions, and one if you're dealing with mean. So if you're asked to find a confidence interval by hand for proportions, the first thing you have to do is find p hat. So either they'll give you p hat, which is the percentage, or you're going to have to divide the number of successes over your sample size to find the actual percentage. The second step is that you need to find that standard error estimate. So when we're doing confidence intervals, we're trying to use our samples to predict our population. So since we don't have P, the population percentage, we can use P hat to estimate it. And then the third step, typically you guys are going to be calculating 95% confidence intervals because it's that nice sweet spot where you don't get an interval that's so big that it's meaningless, but you also don't get one that's so small that you start to lose your level of confidence. So to find a 95% confidence interval, you're going to do p hat plus or minus two times that standard error estimate. So this is for like, if you don't have a, uh, a population and you're trying to draw from your sample to the population? Exactly. All right, and then for means, you're probably going to already have it, but I'll just say find X bar and S. I say find, they're actually going to be given to you. I wouldn't put you guys through the ringer like that. The standard error is still going to be sigma divided by n. Um, on the proportions, are those ones the um, like two and three? We can. There's uh, calculators for both of those, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. Good. All right, and then for three, when you want to find a confidence interval, you would have to do x bar plus or minus t times the standard error. Now, to find t, you would have to use that table and use the degrees of freedom and all that stuff, which is a giant pain in the butt. So for this one especially, but this goes for both of them, just use technology. So use those websites that I gave you guys. And what's the T again? So the T is going to be a value, kind of like the Z score. But the way we find T is that you have to use the degrees of freedom 
and the confidence level. And then you find it on a table. Okay, yeah, that is after work. I kind of, I think, struggle with the, like using the technology, like what number is what I'm looking for. If that makes sense, like. Yeah, for sure. How about we go through um, two different examples of using these guys and I can show you guys how to use it. Sounds good? All right, yeah, thank you. Okay. You're like, no, I don't wanna do it. <laughs> Let me pause here for a second. All right. We sample fifty six families. and found they received on average 19 holiday cards with an SD of six cards. Construct a 95% confidence interval. And interpret. So after you guys, um, Get that written down. Just throw me up an emoji so I know that I can pull up the uh, other screen. Hi, Kirby. Hi, Santa. Thanks, Maddie. Maddie, how's your arm doing? Um, it's doing pretty good. I still have uh two and a half more weeks in my sling, so it's kind of annoying, but. By next quarter, I'll be out of it. Oh, sweet. Well, if you need anything, let me know, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Cool, cool. So, I'm just pulling up that website. <clears throat> so, to do this one, we're going to go to that confidence interval calculator for proportion and mean website that's on the technology section of the unit five. Um, so the first thing that we wanna do, and this is key. So I know it's gonna sound um, kind of silly that I'm really emphasizing this, but when you guys are taking your exam, it's very easy to forget. Sometimes we look here and we're like, wait, what? Where do I put the mean and the standard deviation? We have to remember to go over to the left-hand side and click confidence intervals for mean then we can enter our data. So for this example, we have a sample size of 56. The average, so these families received an average of 19 holiday cards with a standard deviation of six. And we wanna find a confidence interval of 95. So we're all good, we're gonna hit calculate. And it's going to give us our upper and lower bound right here. So that would be our answer. Be the interval from 17.39 to 20.61. All this other information up here is giving you like the standard error, what the T value should be. <clears throat> And then it's also giving you kind of an ugly form of how to find um, that confidence interval. So that would be our confidence interval right there. And the interpretation would be, we are 95% confident 
confident. That the true population average is somewhere between 17.39 and 20.61. So what that means is that if I actually interviewed every single person that received holiday cards and I took all of the holiday cards, add them up and divided by all the people, I'm 95% sure that that final average would come out to be somewhere between 17.39 and 20.61. Now, is there a possibility that my number is not good and maybe the average amount of holiday cards is something lower or something higher than this? Yeah, of course there's a possibility I'm wrong. There's probably a 5% probability that I'm wrong. So, Shannon, did that help you figure out how to use that calculator? Yeah, and the one I really struggle with is like the, I guess the like um, hypothesis testing and Z-score one, or the, no, the, <laughs> Z test and T test. Yeah, the other one is the one that I really get like, I think I mix numbers up and stuff. So, all right, I have hopefully a quick fix for that. Because yeah. we talked about this in one of my other classes. All right. So, here is the website for doing a proportion test. And I think that the biggest thing that people are confused about isn't where to put these numbers in, it's what these numbers are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So here's what these numbers are, is that before you even put your sample in, what it's doing is it's highlighting the areas where you would have pretty extreme values for your sample, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's like these areas is where you could, if your sample falls in these areas, then you can reject the null hypothesis. And then this line is telling you where your sample actually falls. So since your sample doesn't actually fall in these blue areas, then you don't get to reject your null hypothesis. So I know that's not the numbers that you're asking about, but does that idea make sense so far? Yes, yeah. So what they do up here is that they have those numbers and then they have your actual sample right here. So they're like, hey, if your z-score is above this, then you get to reject the null hypothesis. And this is your significance level of 5%, and then this is your actual sample. So the key thing that I'm trying to say here is that you should ignore this side and use these numbers on the right-hand side. Okay, and the 1.58 is? That's your z-score. Okay. And then so, right here is your p-value. Okay, and so, okay, cool. So if the p is above the um, alpha, then we reject, that's that one, right? Or, I mean, if the P is lower than. Right, if the P yeah. value is lower than this, then you get to reject. Okay. Yep, and it tells you right here too, it says do not reject the null hypothesis. Yeah. Yep, okay. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. All right, awesome. Good job, guys. So um, that is definitely what I would put on my note card. There's a couple of other things that I would put on. I have five minutes left, so I'm going to write those things down for you. 
and hopefully these are the most current units. So hopefully they're still fresh in your mind and they're um, current in your notes and you can go back and um, maybe you don't have to shake your memory up as much as you did for the past unit. So for chi-squared, the big thing that I would write down on my note card is the expected count is row total times column total. divided by overall total. And the degrees of freedom for this one, you're not gonna do N minus one. That's when you're dealing with averages. Since in chi-square, we're dealing with comparing two categorical variables, you're going to do the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. And just as a note for this, don't include totals. So what I mean by that is that when you have a table and let's say you have ABC and DE you usually have a column where you have the totals for each variable. You're not going to include these guys when you're figuring out your degrees of freedom. So in this case, your degrees of freedom would be 3 minus 1 times 2 minus 1. So when you're using those chi-square calculators, don't include the total columns either. You just want the basic observations. The calculator is going to find the totals for you. All right, and last but not least, we are going to have Unit nine, when we're talking about linear equations, the big thing that I would remember about unit nine is that y equals bx plus a. And your b value equals r times sy over sx. And your A value is Y bar minus B times X bar. All right. Let me know when you have that written down. So on the final, how many uh, written responses do you think there are? Uh, I think there's like two, maybe. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, not a lot. <clears throat> All right, so before I let you guys go, I just want to